good morning. Um, we have a couple of announcements this morning, so what we'll do is we'll start off and we'll talk about one and then we'll give you the opportunity to ask any questions if you might have some, then we'll go into the second announcement to give you the opportunity again to ask some questions and then we'll open it up. Um, but thank you all for being here this morning. Governor Branstead, of course, is in here. He's in Washington, D.C. today for the World Health Care Congress. Um, yesterday, Governor Branstead and I had the opportunity to tour storm-affected areas in Creston. Um, of course, it's near and dear to me. That's close to where I live, and I had the opportunity to represent uh, Union County in my Senate district when I served in the State Senate. Uh, I did not have the opportunity to, to travel on to Thurman, but Governor Branstead did also tour Thurman uh, yesterday afternoon. And the damage that we viewed was really a bit breathtaking. It's sad when you see the amount of devastation, especially as we toured the hospital, a newly remodeled wing that was scheduled for a grand opening next week, uh, as well as the dormitories at Southwestern Community College that had only been in existing, uh, existence about two years. But I tell you what, as, as horrific and as devastating as it was, it is just so inspirational to see the neighbors and the people that come together. It is so Iowa to help in any way that they can, from the Salvation Army to the Red Cross. I had law enforcement there from Clark County as well as surrounding areas. There were EMC uh, volunteers from Lenox who, were, who said, you know, they were helping us when it hit us a year ago. Uh, so people just drop everything and, and were busy doing everything that they could to volunteer and, and help out. So uh, our prayers continue to be with those that have been impacted by the damage, the tornado, uh, this weekend. And we'll continue to do everything that we can to assist them as they work through cleaning up and, and uh, moving forward. But that's why today uh, I believe it's so fitting for us to address a topic that we decided on last week. And it really showcases another instance of sacrifice uh, shown by Iowans over 150 years ago. The Iowa Civil War, nothing but victory, opens Saturday uh, and will last through the spring of 2013 at the State Historical Museum. Iowa, along with uh, the rest of America, is commemorating the sesquicentennial of the Civil War. Uh, this is a major exhibit opening and we expect very strong turnout. The museum has received inquiries from the Civil War historians and others all across the country and a few from around the world. Uh, just this week, more than 2,000 students will visit the exhibit with thousands more expected uh, on field trips through the end of May and an additional 1,200 during the upcoming National History Day uh, state competitions. So we are, of course, encouraging families and parents and grandparents to bring their children and their grandchildren to share in the experience of seeing this exhibit. The governor did the kickoff on Friday, um, so it's great turnout and had wonderful comments. And uh, Kevin and I had the opportunity to go on Saturday. We only got about halfway through it, so we still uh, have a lot to see and we're looking forward to, go, to going back. It's one of the largest in Iowa at 10,000 square feet, and it includes um, an exhibition gallery and a Civil War battle flag gallery and both focuses specifically on Iowa's role in the Civil War. It has more than 300 artifacts uh, on display, which includes portraits, documents, uniforms, canyon, cannons, swords, guns, uh, just a whole host of keep, keepsakes from the Civil War. Uh, there also will be complimentary programming throughout the run of the exhibition, uh, including a Lunch and Learn series, which I think is pretty neat, a uh, speaker ser series, and a hands-on demonstration, including how to make hard pack, just in case any of you want to know for those <laughs> vacations uh, that you're heading out on over the summer uh, to, to take with you. You know, Iowa made great sacrifices during the Civil War, and Iowans can be proud of our state's contributions. More than 76,000 Iowans served in the Civil War, and that was nearly half of the eligible men in, this, uh, in the state of Iowa at that time. 13,000 died and another 8,000 were wounded. So uh, we have a, a tremendous amount to be proud of, of the sacrifice that was made by Iowans as they continue to do with our National Guard. And now it, it's my pleasure to turn the podium over to Director County who will give you a little bit more information. Thank you. Uh, as I'm sure you can all imagine, as they mentioned, the governor was there on Thursday night for the PIP preview. 
And as Lieutenant Governor mentioned, uh, our curators always get nervous touring the governor around because, of course, it really ends up being the governor correcting their historical facts <laughs> and throughout the tour. So uh, that, that was uh, wonderful to experience uh, with him as he recollected, obviously, uh, some of his memories and uh, his, obviously, love of history. So thank you again, Lieutenant Governor uh, Reynolds, for having me here today. And first and foremost, I want to thank both the Lieutenant Governor and uh, the Governor for their leadership and their support of the historical building uh, and museum, as well as the Department of Cultural Affairs. Uh, they have been very key in our success and we appreciate it very much. Uh, also, I'd like to recognize our museum team. We have our um, museum director in the back, Susan Claver. Susan came on last October and jumped in right into this labor of love to develop this uh, amazing exhibit over the past few months. And they spent countless hours in developing this exhibit. It's definitely something to know. Uh, we did this all in-house. Uh, uh, company didn't come in and whatnot. We have not uh, done an exhibit like this at 10,000 square feet since Caucus, Iowa, which was back in 2007. So it's definitely a priority for us right now as we move forward to ensure that we are uh, providing access to uh, Iowa's history that all Iowans deserve through the museum and outreach and whatnot. Uh, I'd like to thank, as you see standing behind me, uh, the members of the Sons of Confederate Veterans, the Sons of the Union Veterans, and the Army of the Southwest for representing uh, your units with us today. Uh, I'd also like to mention we had an incredible weekend opening. Beginning last Thursday, we had a VIP preview, and then we did a special event on Friday for specifically for educators. Something that's definitely a focus for us is better connecting our exhibits with educators in terms of how we can tie it to the core curriculum. It's very important to us uh, to make sure that we are providing those tools to teachers to ensure that they are able to uh, you know, better use Iowa studies uh, in their curriculum. And we can provide that. We have the expertise. And then obviously trying to give as many students the sort of hands-on experience of coming to see the exhibit. We had over 1,200 visitors uh, in the past few days, which is just extraordinary. And I think shows uh, the importance of what we do in terms of being able to provide this access to I um, Iowans and their history, but also as you all may know, we are free and open to the public seven days a week. Uh, this week alone, we'll have over 1,000 students coming through the building, uh, participating in different programs. Uh, and so we are very excited as we move forward to continue to have different programs. The Lieutenant Governor mentioned one, including Lunch and Learns, different speakers. On, uh, on Saturday, we had two his history professors come in and do specific programming. Uh, a little back and forth, and we had a lot of adults there as well, so we have to remember that we're trying to develop lifelong learners, and that starts not only with students, but can be involve adults as well as families. Uh, as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, um, uh, a couple of the different instances, but more importantly, how many Iowans served in the wards. Uh, we timed this exhibit, and this was actually last week with the Battle of Shiloh. Uh, what I found amazing and very symbolic, and that Iowans should be very proud of, is uh, how many we, what lives we lost in the Battle of Shiloh, which was April 6th and 7th, 150 years ago. Uh, one in four Union casualties were Iowans. I think this is just a staggering number when you think uh, that more Americans died in this battle than any previous American war. Uh, compared to other states, Iowa obviously made a huge sacrifice, and this exhibit is there to honor, uh, is there to honor, excuse me, <clears throat> those who served and uh, those who supported them from home. Uh, during the planning stages, we considered what to include in this exhibit and wanted to tell the stories of the soldiers day to day, real life experiences in addition to key events and battles. Uh, we've incorporated such things uh, as experiences in the words of Jacob Rittner in a letter to his wife, as uh, they expected nothing but victory, which is part of where the uh, title of the exhibit comes from, and what they delivered with great sacrifice. Uh, additionally, we have uh, the story of Lennox College Dean James McKean, who volunteered, as did most of his students, closing the college for a while. Uh, we show uh, McKean's sword used in battle. We also have uh, a hole in the wall which was contributed by Samuel Byers, who was held and uh, captured in battle and escaped by carving a hole in the wall with a spoon or a fork, which we have on display. He went back down to South Carolina to get it and bring it back, and we have that actual hole. Uh, 
he also wrote the famous song, Shannon's March to the Sea, uh, which obviously is very symbolic of that time. We also recognize the ultimate sacrifice of Shelby Norman of Muscatine, which was, uh, who was one of Iowa's first casualties in battle. Uh, we, uh, as the Lieutenant Governor mentioned, we have many artifacts from generals to privates, as well as artifacts from back home, um, including General Dodge's hat, as well as different artifacts from uh, the field, and including different medical equipment and whatnot. Uh, I would also like to mention that we have a traveling exhibit that has been traveling around the state for the past year. This has now reached over 30,000 Iowans. I think this is very important, just as important as this exhibit that obviously is in Des Moines, uh, which, as I mentioned, bringing open to the public, but the traveling exhibit uh, is called The Fiery Trial, and it has been going around to different communities, historical societies, schools, and has been really wonderful in terms of uh, hearing about really about small underserved communities that have been able to bring this traveling exhibit uh, with some of them that don't have an actual museum and being able to uh, allow them to connect with uh, Iowa's role in the Civil War. Uh, so I encourage any and all of you to come down. Feel free to reach out to myself or Susan Claver, our museum director. We'd love to give um, any of you your individual tour of the Civil War exhibit. Uh, but more importantly, we have a, a special little something for you today. I know uh, I heard Kay especially had been waiting to have this for lunch. We have some hard tech for you all. Uh, this was cooked up by our battle flag conservator, homemade. This was a staple of uh, a Civil War soldier's daily diet, and they called them belly busters. Uh, it's basically flour, water, salt, but it was able to be preserved and travel around, and it lasted a really long time. Uh, so I encourage you to all sample one. We'll be handing those out. And with that, I'd like to thank again Lieutenant Governor for having me here today. Again, we look forward to seeing you all down at the Historic Museum. Thank you. Are there any questions? Are there any questions? <coughs> Very thorough review. Well, and I want to thank um, Director County for her service. I think she's the youngest uh, <coughs> department director that we have serving the state of Iowa. She's done a phenomenal job with a very approval budget of really uh, providing some great exhibits uh, and really uh, taking that cultural affairs to the next level. <coughs> Now, Christian, with Startup City Des Moines, and Tesh came in with the uh, Confederate men and, and had some trouble with it. I said, you know, you thought technology was hard. Try getting through the metal detectors with a sword on your side. <laughs> so, you know, this is nothing compared to what you had to deal with this morning to get them in here and to be part of the uh, uh, press conference. So thank you. Our second announcement is an exciting opportunity for us to blend um, the administration's transparency goals as well as our commitment to creating 200,000 new jobs uh, in Iowa through a new initiative called Startup Iowa. Uh, Startup Iowa is bringing the open data movement to Iowa with the Open Iowa competition, which is April 27th through the 29th. This three-day coding event, the first of its kind in the state, challenges developers to turn vast amounts of government data into something that benefits state residents, uh, visitors, as well as businesses. Open Iowa participants will be given access to already published uh, city, county, state databases prior to the event. The Codathon will kick off next Friday, I believe, uh, with pitches for using the data for web and for mobile and software applications. And then the voting, uh, the voting will narrow down the ideas and teams will be formed. And then the coders, the designers, and the data experts will then have two days to really bring those projects to life. Uh, data initiatives such as this one have been gaining uh, momentum since the 2009 launch of data.gov and one of the first open data competitions in the United States, Apps for Democracy, was held in Washington, D.C. in 2008 and it led to the creation of over 47 iPhone, Facebook, and web applications and <coughs> $6.6 million into the local economy. And similar contests have popped up all across uh, the country and really across the world. So it really is gaining some great momentum. Our event is being organized uh, by Startup Iowa and other partner organizations, which include the state of Iowa, the Des Moines Register, Polk County, and the city of Des Moines. Startup Iowa is an ambitious initiative to provide resources and visibility to Iowa entrepreneurs, from Dubuque to Council Bluffs to Cedar Rapids to Cedar Falls to Ames. Iowa has an abundant resources for entrepreneurs and startups. 
Startup Iowa joined the Startup America Partnership on December 13th of 2011. It was actually the eighth region. And as I talked about the momentum that we're seeing across the nation, I think it's 18 right now, or currently 18. So it really is a, uh, the, the thing to do, and, and Iowa was number eight, so we're proud of that. Startup Iowa is focused on helping startups grow and create jobs uh, and value within Iowa and supports the main goals of Startup America Partnership, which are to provide valuable resources and connections to help young companies grow, support regional startup ecosystems throughout the country, uh, recognize startups as the drivers of our economy and really the founders as American heroes. And Iowa really is uniquely positioned to leverage our national strengths in biosciences, advanced materials, and information technology over the next decade. Startup Iowa continues to develop Iowa entrepreneurial ecosystem by building tool tools and coordinating events such as the Iowa Startup Fair, which featured over 100 startups in seven locations throughout the state, and it hosted over 400 visitors. Iowa Startup and uh, the Iowa Startup and Entrepreneurial Calendar, which provides a central location, is kind of a one-stop shop uh, for entre entrepreneurials with startup events that are being held throughout and around the state. And then Iowa's a Startupedia, a Wikipedia of entrepreneurial knowledge built by the community itself. Um, so now open, uh, and now open Iowa. Uh, for more information, you can go to startupiowa.org and Startup City Des Moines is going to host the event. Um, they are an early stage technology startup incubator anchored in the middle of Silicon 6th Avenue right here in Des Moines. So with that, I'm very excited to turn it over to Kristen. Thank you. Feel horribly underbearded. <laughs> Where's your hat? Right? Yeah, exactly. I, didn't, I didn't bring a sword or a gun, so I guess I'm going to be okay. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, and the Governor, and, and uh, State CIO Lauren Trich for being so open. And, and uh, did I mispronounce your name? I got an eyebrow. Okay. Um, for being so open uh, in, in this. Obviously, there have been other parts of the country that have tried to do these sorts of uh, efforts and not necessarily work hand in hand uh, with local government. So I, I'd like to thank. Uh, the leadership from the state and in Humboldt County and from the city of Des Moines, and also for the for the Des Moines Register and their generous sponsorship of the event. Um, so, Startup Iowa, as the Lieutenant Governor said, is merely an umbrella uh, to encapsulate all the great entrepreneurial activity that's already going on throughout the state. We have a lot to celebrate. Uh, we only have three million people, but we have more entrepreneurial activity going on here than the states two, three, four times our size, and we often overlook that in sort of our Iowa humbleness. So this is a great opportunity for us to celebrate that. This is another opportunity for us uh, to lead, which is what we've been doing with Startup Iowa as part of the Startup America Partnership. Um, uh, as the Lieutenant Governor said, we've done a few things. We did a startup fair uh, to raise visibility of the startups and the work that, that is being done. Uh, and obviously, startups don't have a lot of money to spend to go out and get their products uh, purchased and marketing and sales. So this was an opportunity to do that. Centralized event calendar, that was sort of low-hanging fruit. And then the Startupedia, which is sort of a tribal knowledge repository for all the startups, so we can aggregate things that we learn as far as being in Western and Iowa entrepreneurs. Um, this is going to be a great event. It's modeled in some part after Startup Weekend, if any of you are familiar with that, which usually contains about 100 and some odd entrepreneurs. They get together for the weekend and they put their head down and they actually build things over the course of about a 52 hour period. And I mean, iPhone apps, I mean, Facebook apps, these things are in the store by the end of the week. Uh, so we're going to be doing the same thing, and in this particular case, if this were a Top Chef competition, what they're going to be creating from is all the government data that's been made available to us and has been sitting there sort of poorly underutilized. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for them to, as many of them are very, very politically active and socially active, um, there's a high degree of civitas in the startup community, uh, this is a chance for them to demonstrate that with the skills that they already have. So thank you again for making it possible and for supporting them. Yes. Any questions? Why do you think that uh, Iowa has so much entrepreneurial activity? Is it our immortally high uh, property tax rates? Wow. Segway. Yeah, there we go. Just talk about the last part of the question. Sorry, I didn't worry about But seriously, I mean, is there, uh, why would Iowa have more entrepreneurial activity than states through? What's more entrepreneurial than putting seeds in the ground and praying to God that right. they're actually going to bloom? I mean, we have that in our DNA. Yeah. Right? It's very much part That's of our culture. Uh, farming and, and then uh, obviously now uh, with all the students that are getting involved and they see the great things that can happen with making a job versus taking a job, 
they see that's been, that's being slowly destigmatized here in the Midwest. And so we're really creating a center of gravity for them to stay local and not defect on the coasts and build their businesses here. And the cost of doing it is going to be more than actually things like cloud computing. It costs tens of thousands of dollars, not millions of dollars. So we're very interested. Well, and we were talking on Friday or whenever I was there too, really the capital it takes right now because of the amount of uh, resources and some of the things that you're doing at Star City Des Moines is really lower, so there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, but I won't miss the opportunity to, again, address the high commercial property tax in the state of Iowa and the barrier that that places on business and startups. Uh, when the governor talks a lot about the net net lease and why our proposal is so important because it is permanent tax relief, it is for these very entrepreneurial and startup companies that are renting their office space or gathering at Startup City Des Moines to coordinate, collaborate, come up with great ideas and, and provide the support and the encouragement or like, well, this doesn't work, but hey, maybe I can help with this. Uh, so it's important that we, we eliminate any barrier that we can to, to startup companies um, so that we can encourage innovation and entrepreneurial and as Christian uh, indicated, keep our young people right here in Des I love that we are calling it the Silicon Sixth Avenue. Uh, I, I got to Startup City last week, but I hope to get out on Sixth Avenue and stop in and just say hi and, and talk to the different uh, businesses that are located there. Uh, right now, Director Glass is taking his ACT exams, um, along with a professor from Kentucky after a, a tweet that asked the governor and lawmakers to take the exams. Do you have any plans to do that as well? Well, you know, I, it probably would be an okay thing for us to do. Um, I, I didn't wasn't aware that he was doing that, so good for him. I think it's a good indicator so we can see what the, we're asking students to do. Uh, but, you know, we're encouraging all, uh, part of our proposal, our education proposal is to require all 11th graders to take the ACT exam. The state would fund the cost of that. And it's a, it's a way for us to see where we're at, to see where we're ranking, but more importantly, for those students to see where they need to change and where they need to adapt so that they can be better prepared for either a career or post-secondary education. So um, it's been a while, but uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't shy away from the challenge. Do I have to uh, release the score? As long as I have some preparation time, then uh, we consider that. But, no, good for him. Good for him. <clears throat> the state of Iowa is self-insured. What are the plans for the preparers at SWIC? Uh, do you intend to have those repairs completed for the start of the summer term? Or? You know, well, I, we actually got to talk to President Crittenden yesterday. Uh, she was uh, on the ground with gloves in hand, a pair of jeans, picking up uh, debris. Right now, they were working with uh, hotels in the area so that they would have a place for the students to house. It was the dormitories that basically were hit, as well as the um, uh, the Boe the Boe Center, I think, has pretty significant damage to it. And then they were assessing the college as a whole. I think they might have lucked out as far as that. Uh, they are insured. I mean, she. I don't know. They're still doing the assessment. They had people in checking this, the structure uh, requirement, the structural uh, the structures. I guess we'll just stop with that. I don't know what else to say. Well, each one of the buildings. So they'll continue to assess that moving forward. Were any, was your personal property damaged at all? I live in Osceola, so um, Kevin and I were in Des Moines, and as far as I know, he went home yesterday, we didn't have any. Osceola really did, they had a lot of wind, and they got some hail, but didn't experience any of the devastation that he County to get, so we're very fortunate. Um, but, you know, I was just, you know, there were some homes that were damaged. Uh, the bus barn at the elementary received some damage. The Y there had some significant damage done to it. So everybody, uh, they had inspectors down, so they were picking up, trying to uh, take out stuff that was sal salvageable and, and just really assess the situation. Great, thank you.